Safe are in listen only mode. On behalf of RBCS, welcome to this webinar on seven deadly testing sins. I am Rex Black, president of RBCS, a worldwide testing and quality assurance firm serving clients ranging from small startups to Fortune 20 global enterprises. Since 1994, in fact, 24 years as of this month, we have delivered insight and confidence to hundreds of clients around the world. Our team of international consultants deliver customized training, consulting, and expert services to companies that are looking to improve their test and quality assurance practices. I am the author of 13 going on 14 books on software talent and testing, as well as being the past president of the ISTQB. Uh, for those of you who are PMI folks, attendance at today's webinar does earn PMI PDUs. Thank you to Mike Lindhorst for reviewing the materials for PDU status and for making valuable suggestions. Attendees will receive an email telling them how to claim PDUs, including the PDU code. PDUs are available for live webinar attendance only. Before we start the presentation, just keep in mind you can submit questions at any time, but they will only be answered at the end. Hope you enjoy this free webinar from RBCS. We do these free webinars as a service to the software testing community because at RBCS we are a not just for profit company. This webinar displays knowledge and insights that could be useful for you or in your organization in terms of improvements. Please make RBCS your preferred vendor for any training, consulting, or expert services you might need in the area of testing or quality. Uh, send us an email, info at rbcs-us.com. We'll be happy to send you a bid. We don't expect to win all your work, but we would like the opportunity to try. Okay, so seven deadly sins. <clears throat> this is a painting by Hieronymus Bosch, uh, as you can see there. Uh, not sure if you're familiar with his work, but he was a um, European artist who is uh, famous for these sort of fantastical paintings uh, that often had to do with uh, horrible things that happened to people after they had lived bad lives and died. <laughs> so, hence themes of, of deadly sins of various kinds. Um, and what we're going to talk about today isn't anywhere near as grim as that, but certainly there can be some negative repercussions um, that uh, you'll want to avoid. And I'm going to try to give you some ideas on how to avoid them. So one of the things that I've noticed is that, uh, you know, as a consultant, as a software testing professional, uh, I've been involved in software engineering since 1983, I've seen smart and otherwise capable people and teams sabotage themselves in various ways. And in testing, I, what I noticed when I uh, put together this presentation originally back five years ago was uh, there's, there's usually one or more of the following things in, in in, in action or um, uh, applicable in those situations. So there's irrelevance, ignorance of the relevant skills or facts, <clears throat> excuse me, obstructionism, adversarialism, nitpicking, being blind to the larger priorities, and what I've uh, made up a new word for last momentism. Um, so let's go through each one of these seven deadly sins and talk about uh, how to stop being a sinner and how to uh, uh, clean up any sort of uh, messes that may have uh, been created by uh, past sins, how to uh, absolve yourself, as it were. So irrelevance or redundancy refers to testing groups that test things that, that don't matter or repeat things that have already been covered by other groups. Um, and um, Part of this is just making sure that you have good awareness of, of what the other groups are covering. Uh, now, in a perfect world, you would have what is in ISTQB terminology anyway referred to as a master test plan, which would talk about how you would coordinate all of the different test conditions and scope uh, across the different groups involved um, to, to make sure that there's no, uh, there are no gaps, um, you know, coverage areas that are missing, not because they don't need to be covered, but because people are assuming somebody else is getting to it. You also want to avoid, in this case, overlap, um, which is where you're doing something or somebody else is doing something that's already been done. Um, and specifically the sin here is that you are doing something that's already been done. You're not adding any value. Um, or you're just sort of, you, you, you're 
testing areas that people aren't particularly concerned about. This is the irrelevance part. Uh, uh, that they they look the same in, the, in that they both both of these things either doing doing that which is irrelevant or doing that which is redundant and thus already done by somebody else uh, reduces the value of your um, test and your test results. So coordination um, is one piece of the puzzle, and risk based testing to focus your testing on what really matters is the other big piece of the puzzle here. Uh, <clears throat> just the fact that you start to Addressing this issue, if, if you have this problem, by by putting risk-based testing in place and and um, doing make out reaching out to the other test stakeholders to do this coordination work, even if it doesn't result in a written master test plan, but some sort of verbal agreement of okay, that's your sandbox, this is my sandbox, that's this other person's sandbox. We're each going to be in our own sandbox and not, you know, get in each other's way. Um, that that shows that you're serious about resolving the problem. Now, I want to illustrate each one of these sins with a case study. I'm going to start off by my own, what we would call a mea culpa. I, I, I am guilty of this. So very early in my career, um, I was testing an application that was a multi-database, multi-operating system query tool. Excuse me, I had to get a drink of water there. And um, the we had this, this automated system it had a this the thing that we were testing had a command line interface it made it just perfect for automating uh, very stable simple syntax and it was really easy to interact with from a, uh, a scripting language so we used we use uh, scripts um, you know for those of you who are familiar with doing things like with you know Ruby and Perl is basically that same kind of concept and uh, so we built these fairly complex uh, uh, sets of tests to test all sorts of different combinations of operating systems and, and databases. But basically, we were doing this huge automated compatibility test, which, you know, was important because we were also testing functionality, the accuracy of the of the results, uh, the queries, and that was what the tool did. But one of the things that we weren't looking at was installation. Uh, and the other thing, another thing we weren't looking at was usability. You can't really automate those tests very easily in a lot of cases. And so, since we were focused on automating, we weren't thinking about these other two areas. And, and this, when when this was brought to our attention that, that, that this was a utterly unacceptable omission on our parts and we needed to address it, unfortunately, by the time that was brought to our attention, there had been a lot of reputational damage that uh, were, was very difficult to undo. Um, <clears throat> so while... We were providing fantastic compatibility risk mitigation and accuracy risk mitigation and regression risk mitigation because we were able to run these thousands of tests every single time we got a new release. Uh, unfortunately, these other two areas were seen as equally important risk areas, and we completely dropped the ball there. So you uh, you don't want to do that because uh, you know again this is coming across as uh, as somewhat irrelevant. Now, in those cases, it wasn't so much that we we didn't we didn't think about it. We just we were we thought that we were focused on the right things, but we actually weren't because we hadn't communicated. And another another thing that can happen is that you can be completely ignorant of some important skill or fact, um, and it can lead to to similar kinds of mistakes as what I just talked about, or or even worse. Um, and, and basically, you know, some sort of technical testing or application skill may be missing. And those, those are sort of the big three for testers is adequate technical knowledge, adequate testing skills, adequate application skills. And if you've got problems in those three areas, you're, you're not going to be able to do your job very well. Um, <clears throat> another thing that can happen here is that you are not really fully aware of, of what's going on in your organization or what the users do with your application. And so you're again like not you're not directing your your testing energies in in the right place or right places. So if if what you've got primarily is a um, a skills thing a skills gap, then what you want to do is um, use task analysis, identify a list of critical skills, analyze where your 
team stands with respect to those skills and use hiring and skills growth and team development plans to try to fill those gaps in your in your skills. Um, this is a long term project, so it's not something that you can expect that you're going to start it and you're going to be done in a day uh, for sure. It's something that, that you know can take a couple years to really get good skill alignment with your team and your organizational needs. But it's definitely something that you should start right away and make a very high priority. This is especially true if you're a test manager in a agile type of um, setting where the usually the day-to-day -day tactical responsibility for what gets done in terms of the test getting run and so forth and planning is handled by the testers embedded within the team. So this is, this is really the prime focus of most test managers in agile organizations is uh, professional development of their, of their testers. Um, now, in terms of the lack of awareness of organizational and user context, the trick here is to make sure that you are well connected with other testing stakeholders so that you can get that information flowing into you and, and you know, pull that information in. Make sure that you're going out and asking. When part of the part of the thing that happened with me in the previous scenario was just sitting there, you know, assuming that everything was fine because I hadn't been hearing um Otherwise, um, well, you know, people people won't always go up and tap you on the forehead and say, hey, you're being a bonehead right now in what you're doing. You know, you um, you really, you know, you have to pull that kind of information out. So I guess what I'm saying is it, 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 there was sort of a combo thing going on in the previous scenarios. To some extent, I had a lack of that of that larger awareness. Now, to, to focus in on the skills area, you know, here's here's the thing. I, I we, we deliver training as well as consulting and expert services. And so I've spent a fair amount of time, you know, training people in how to apply um, what are really fundamental test design best practices, many of which have been around since at least Glenford Meyer's book, The Art of Software Testing, came out in like 1979 or something like that. So, you know, we're talking about test techniques that are older than a lot of the people that I'm teaching the test techniques to. Sadly, they are not older than me, um, but they are, they are older than a lot of the people I'm teaching the techniques to. And, you know, just basic stuff like equivalence partitioning, boundary value analysis, they don't know how to do it. They may be familiar with the terms, but when you say, well, design me a set of tests and show me that you've covered the equivalence partitions, they, they don't often know how to do it. Uh, and this is, this is kind of stunning. Um, and um, it, it obviously puts, puts testers at a real disadvantage because, you know, the, there, there are certain basic things that their programmer colleagues are expected to know, um, and if they didn't know those basic things, they'd be like, you know, their peers would be looking at them like, you're actually a programmer and you don't know how to do that? Um, you know, so this is... Um, is part of, uh, of, of one of the problems that organizations, testing organizations and testers have. Um, and it leads to a, a sort of a aiding and abetting the people that I'll sort of provocatively call proponents of ignorance um, that create problems of, uh, you know, you, you may have heard this, the uh, people saying, well, anyone can test. How hard could it be? Just make sure it works before we put it into production. Well, you know, of course, these people don't understand that what they're asking for is a complete impossibility. You can't make sure something works before you put it into production because you can't run every possible test. And thus, you can't prove that there are no bugs. Um, so, you know, that 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 idea is out there. And of course, that that leads to this idea that testing is just purely commoditized and should be sent to the lowest bidder, um, which then, of course, becomes a uh, self uh, vicious circle, right? <laughs> like it, so, you know, if what you see is people that don't know how to apply proper testing skills doing testing, well, you know, what is that likely to be very impressive as a res the results of that? Um, sometimes you run into people who are opposed to actually training the testers in any sort of structured way, um, learning these proven best practices that have been around for a long, long time. Um, this creates another other challenges. Fortunately, th th this does seem to be changing. Um, the ISTQB program has been very helpful to that. Of course, I have a, 
I have a view that's affected by my client base. Obviously, people that, that I work with, clients that I work with, are obviously accepting of the idea that this is important. Have testers have these skills? Um, you know, I suspect that there is a there's a, a quite a few uh, organizations out there that are like you know tester skills. We don't need no stinking tester skills, or even worse, testers. We don't need no stinking testers. Um, I also think, frankly, and again, this is kind of a, you know, a uh, um, controversial thing to say, but I'm going to say it because I think it's true that this whole idea that's swirled around for the last 15 years, this whole schools of testing concept and the context-driven testing school and this sort of catechism that the people that, that are adherents of context-driven testing are have to repeat in public to be accepted, like there are no good best practices and so forth. That really creates barriers, uh, discourage um, uh, discourse and exchange of ideas. Uh, I'm starting to see that go away over the last few years, which has been a real relief. Some of the rigidity um, has has gone out of that, but certainly it's uh, you know it was a concern. Um, Okay, whoops. Sorry. Got uh, a little slide advance problem there. <clears throat> okay, so the next deadly sin here is obstructionism. Um, I'll let the, let the Air Force fly overhead. That's uh, United States Air Force training their uh, pilots there in a T-4. That was that noise that you just heard. Um <clears throat> So the next de deadly sin here is obstructionism, which is where the tester basically gets in the way rather than helping, even though the tester may very well think they are helping. Um, so um, saying, yeah, you know, we have we've defined these entry and exit criteria and we need to stick with those or we've got this definition of ready and definition of done and we need to stick with those and they can never, ever compromise on those. Um, you know, it, now, now, to some extent, you don't want to just say, oh, yeah, whatever, do whatever you want. But at the same time, if conditions actually truly have changed, you know, maybe you need to be a little more flexible. Um, I've also seen situations where people exaggerate um, obstacles, declare something to be an absolute showstopper, has to be resolved. And then you look at it, it's like, yeah, no, you, you know. It's bad. That's that's a that's bad. But you know, other things that are that might happen if you stop and try to deal with that could be worse. Um, and you know, another a, 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 another variant of this is organizations decide that they're they're going to do something. They're going to try to do test automation. They're going to try to do ag adopt agile methods or uh, DevOps or Kanban or something like that. And then the tests are like, no, no, we can't do that. As you know, or you know, the 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 thing that's been going on online, social media for about the last year and a half of this this completely silly thing, where it's like, well, automated tests aren't tests; they're checking. You know, like, well, I mean, what what exactly is that? Is other than just trying to to throw shade on on test automation, and and for what purpose? I mean, automated tests are a form of verification. You need validation too, but you need them both. Um, you know, so that's just obstructionism, and unfortunately, you get some leading voices in the in the field going around and, and banging that gong um, in in social media in front of their followers, and I think they end up dragging a lot of people into situations where they're really doing a great deal of damage to their own viability in the organization. If you make a habit out of standing up and putting yourself in opposition to the declared goals and objectives of, of management, senior people in your organization, you're not long for that organization. Uh, you know, there's, a, there's a name for that kind of thing. It's called the uh, obstruction, uh, uh, obstructionist personality disorder. <laughs> if it's a chronic thing, you know that's not it's not really a good uh, um, uh, career move. Um, now, in some cases. Um, you know, this happens because the the testers have been told or think they've been told that they are supposed to be a process cop. And some testers get into this, fall into this when, as part of an agile transition, they manage to get themselves made scrum master where they actually are supposed to um, ensure that the process is being carried out. But then they take that a step further and say, well, 
you know, I'm here to make sure that, um, you know, we, we are inflexible, which then, uh, you know, becomes obstruction. Now, if, if you're a manager and you have one of these people that has a sort of this, this oppositional personality disorder thing going on where they're, they're just obstructing all the time because they're contrary, you know, that's very hard to fix. Um, and, you know, frankly, I don't know how you fix a person that's got that problem. I think they just have to be invited to pursue other opportunities as a euphemism goes. But let's say that this is a, an issue with just misunderstanding what the proper role of testing is. And, you know, you need to, of course, work with your stakeholders to redefine that and then and then deal with the reputational damage that has has occurred. But, you know, people are used to seeing you as as the person who jumps up in a meeting and yells, oh, contraire, mon frere, I mean, we will not do that. That that cannot be because of X, Y and Z. You know, it's, it takes a while for people to forget that 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 went on. So just to give you an example of this, I mean, I've got. I've, I've worked with a tester and who shall remain nameless. And this guy was a great tester, a really great tester. And he was a great test lead. He, he had great technical skills and, you know, a lot of technical, uh, technical and testing skills. And in a lot of organizations, you know, they're very meritocratic. So people looked up to him and like, Hey, you know, this guy really knows what he's doing. Um, but you, you know, he was he was a professional pessimist to a fault of just oh the product quality is horrible you know this is garbage the developers are making stupid mistakes so now he's getting out of the lane of professional pessimism it's getting into personal stuff and then you know the management team's incompetent he would parody people in the management team um you know behind their back but it, you know probably got out that that was happening um so, you know, as I said, this this kind of thing can really um, um, interfere with your ability to uh, to get work, to keep contracts, because this person worked as a contractor. You know, um, it just it it it's not it's not a plus. Um, you know, so um, being an obstructionist is is a career limiting move to say the least. And I think it also limits your effectiveness because ultimately you get tuned out. Another way to get tuned out is, um, you know, somewhat related adversarialism, which is where you're, again, you're, you're going to be a process cop or a quality cop, and you're going to put yourself, you're going to set yourself up as that person, as that adversary. Um, you know, there was a, a story I heard of a person who, who managed a, testing facility in the U.S. military, and they have a very interesting way of doing testing where it goes through multiple levels where it's it's tested during development, and then there's uh, but then there's what's called DT or developmental testing, and then there's the OT or operational testing. And um, anyway, this guy was in, a, in operational testing, and he had this big sign behind his desk that where he would have meetings with uh, uh, the contractors who are developing the weapon systems and the sign said, we're not happy until you're not happy. <laughs> and to me, that just kind of sums up this idea of adversarialism, testing as the adversary. Um, and, you know, the, the, the idea was certainly had a lot of currency for a number of years in, in the testing world. And I'll admit to sort of falling into that trap once or twice myself. Um, but, you know, you really you're you're there in general to support the team. Now, in in this the specific instance that I just cited, the the person working as an operational tester, that person really is there to protect the military personnel from being injured or or otherwise harmed in some way by a bad weapon system that gets fielded. So the model that the U.S. Um, Department of Defense has chosen to try to do that is, to some extent, this adversarialist kind of model where the operational testing is is there to, you know, be be a be a set of brakes on on bad things getting out. But in most organizations, that kind of adversarialism really is not um, appreciated, and and um, you know, again, it's, it's just it, you become an obstacle. 
So make sure that you have actually discussed what your what your role is, um, what is your mission, what objectives are you supposed to achieve. Um, if somebody says that you're supposed to be a process cop, well, then that's a that's something that needs to be discussed very very carefully. Somebody says that you need to be a quality cop, that's something also that needs to be discussed very very carefully because um, when I've seen that with clients, it's it's not always turned out well. Uh, it's generally turned out poorly, and it's very difficult to undo that perception after after the fact, even once you you get the um, get your role redefined. So it's better to, to, to not step into that to begin with. So as an example of this, um, I, I did some, did an assessment with one client and they, um, the CIO had the previous CIO, um, had, instructed the director of testing that they were basically to be the, the quality cops um, and not just the quality cops, but also the process cops. And so a, um, a life cycle management tool was selected and put into place uh, at the behest of the CIO, but without any sort of political cover from the CIO. He told the director of testing to do this, but he didn't tell other people he told the director of testing to do it. So they went out and they got this tool and they set it up so that you just couldn't do something unless you'd complied with the various uh, effectively entry and exit criteria that were set up for various tasks in this tool. And people spent tremendous amounts of time jumping through hoops to try to make stuff happen. And they felt like that was you know, really distracting them uh, from doing their work, uh, the, the developers especially. Um, and... Worse yet, this tool selection happened completely in the dark. The director of testing and a handful of other people went off and selected the tool and imposed it on everybody. And uh, the relationship was completely poisonous. I mean, I heard things said during discussions with developers in that assessment that were, uh, you know, unlike things I've heard before or since. Um, really, really negative. And on both sides, too, the test on the test side, <clears throat> the testers would say things like, this organization will be a complete train wreck and, and you know, those developers would be throwing garbage into production day and night if we weren't there all the time saving them from themselves. And, you know, I'm, you know the, I'm thinking in my head as I'm hearing this, well, you may be saving them from, this, from themselves, but that's not the way they see it and they certainly don't appreciate it. And you know, developers would be saying things like, those testers are a bunch of idiots. They're completely irrelevant to make quality happen. Uh, they're wasting our time on all this paperwork and we just need to try to route around them. So situation's completely poisonous, and eventually what happened, uh, the new CIO for whom I conducted this assessment that I mentioned um, decided that, you know, that the relationship was irretrievable and these, and these people had to go. Um, so they did, the testers, that is. <laughs> Developers were kept around. Um, I'll point out that the CIO, the old CIO, was still there in another role. He never stepped in, never stepped in once to <clears throat> clarify how the situation had arisen and how what these people were doing was actually what he had told them to do. So they had basically stepped in a you know pile of dog crap that somebody else had told them to step in and then refused to you know, help explain, hey, this is how they got there. This is this is how this happened. So, you know, we have a phrase in the United States called being thrown under the bus. And, and that's that is that's sort of what happened there. So, uh, you know, you, you have to be very careful in these situations. OK, so nitpicking, nitpicking can be a problem. Um, so you get this this perception um, that you know testers inflate severity defect severity they report defects that aren't that important they miss the more important defects you know and 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 it's it's a real it's a real thing it's it, it happens I mean I'm going through a project right now and I'm looking at some defects that people report and then they're calling showstoppers you know again back to what I was discussing earlier and I'm like really that's a sev one defect 
that's like based on that defect alone we should not ship this product like hmm because you know it's a problem but it's not like it's not a showstopper um now sometimes this happens because people feel like only by making a big deal out of everything do i get attention on anything but i think the reality is that it's it's the old um uh at least uh European fable of uh, the boy who cried wolf for some of you who are not, you know, uh, dialing in from outside of that sort of uh, North American European background. Um, you may not have heard that fable, but you can you can find it easily enough online. But basically, it says that if you've um, you have a certain amount of, of credibility and then once you've you've expended it by by making bigger deals out of nothing um, that, you know, people won't listen when the, the something really happens. So um, <clears throat> some things that I would suggest here. For one thing, make sure that the decision about assignment of bug severity and a bug priority and what bugs to fix and which ones to defer is not some sort of poker game where it's all based on, you know, trying to bluff or corner somebody, but it's based on a rational decision-making process. Um, we sh you need to have criteria for priority and severity. So when what one person would call a severity one is the same as what somebody else would call a severity one, and priority, which you know can and should change over time, there should be rational decision making about how that that is done. If you're a test manager and you've got somebody in your team who is what I'm calling here a repeat inflator somebody who's consistently overrating severity, then you need to, to fix their attitude, honestly, and say, look, you, you, are, you are damaging the credibility of the test team by doing this. Another thing that can contribute to this is a sort of ego identification with, uh, with defect reports as a work product. So anytime during an assessment where I hear somebody talk about my bugs in reference to defect reports that they had written, that's when my, my radar starts going off. I'm like, hmm, okay. There could be a problem here because if they're my bugs and they're kind of like my children and I care about what happens to them, right? As it's posted as defect reports. Oh, yeah, we have we, we file a lot of defect reports, you know, and we manage them. But it's just different than I, I'm, you know, I pay attention to my bugs. They're not your bugs, but, you know, they're, they're defect reports that you happen to write. If they're anybody's bugs, they're the bugs belonging to the developers who put them in there. But, you know, watch for that. If you're doing that, you know, you need to kind of back off a little bit uh, and ask yourself, why, why is that so important to you that the bugs that you report get fixed? Um, what's going on there? And is that, is that good, useful, healthy behavior, you know, or is it, or is it problematic? Um, Credibility, you know, there's a saying about credibility, you know, it's it's uh, uh, hours or year, years to gain and, and moments to lose. And it's definitely true. And this kind of nitpicking stuff can really sap your credibility. So if you've if the damage has been done, either you've done it to yourself or been done to the team, it takes a while to fix it. Again, carrying on with what I heard before or what I said before about when I hear my bugs, that phrase, my bugs in a uh, um, assessment interview, that, that always worries me. The other thing that I listen for and ask about when I'm talking about bug reports or defect reports, if you prefer, is like, you know, assignment of severities and how is that done? And then, you know, certainly if people say, well, I, I feel like I have to bump everything up by one severity level, otherwise it's it's going to get ignored, then I'm, I, you know, I have to start asking, well, why do you do that? What, what, what's the, what was that work? And, and what's the reaction of that? Um, you know, one of the things that can make this happen is that um, people have arbitrary targets for the number of bugs of certain severities that, that um, are acceptable for release. And this this leads to all sorts of gaming of severity ratings, which is which is really not healthy. So that that can be a contributor here. Um, but you know, as I said, um, long term, this 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 creates a problem. It's the boy who cried wolf, um, and and it's something that you you really do want to avoid.
Now, next deadly sin here is the uh, blindness to priorities. So not not really being aware of, of, you know, this project, what does success look like for this project? What does success look like for the organization? Uh, this can be the other end of the spectrum, too, is, you know, not assigning the severity high enough because you're not aware of things that would be important. Uh, not testing certain things because people react to the developers react badly. Now, you know, you might say that I'm talking out of both sides of my mouth, but I'm not. I mean, this is, you know, you don't nitpick, but at the same time, you don't shy away from things. You're, you're supposed to be, you know, objective. An objective would mean, you know, both that you don't make a bigger deal out of something that, you know, isn't actually that big of a deal. You don't downplay something that is actually quite serious. Um, now, sometimes this can happen due to just pure isolation. It's not an attempt to be one or the other. It's just you're just not aware of things. So in the case of isolation, you know, building stronger relationships. If you're a tester embedded in an agile team, you really owe it to yourself to get out more, <laughs> get talk to people that are in other agile development teams um, because siloing is a real a real issue. Maybe there's, you know, if you've got a test manager or in some organizations they call these people test coaches, but there's somebody there that can help you break down that siloing so that you're able to communicate effectively with other stakeholders. That's really um, important. Now, the blindness to priorities thing, um, you know, is if you if, if you fix it quickly enough, the, this, the overall symptoms can go away fairly quickly, too. It doesn't tend to build long-term resentments or perceptions of, um, you know, malice or 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 you know, somebody acting in bad faith, you know, uh, this can happen. I mean, you just, you know, sometimes there's things you're not aware of. And if you find out, oh, there's things I'm not aware of, you need to get aware of them quickly and make sure that you put a process in place that's so not going to happen again. I had a colleague who um, was working as a test manager in a sort of startup organization, and um, they had their... Um, uh, funders or their venture capitalists come and tell them, hey, you know, you're, you're, you're burning through money too fast and you need to realize revenue and you need to cut your burn rate, your spending. And um, what happened was that the developers were not cut in staff, but the test team was cut. Like half the testers were let go. And when I tried to dig into what had happened with that, I, what I found out from my from one of my colleagues there who was a development manager he said, you know, the test manager is a good guy and everybody likes him, but he was never really able to explain uh, how testing was valuable to the organization, how it related to the organization's priorities. And as a result, he, you know, it was seen as a kind of a nice to have um, rather than a must have. So, you know, th this is this is something to keep in mind is that, you know, not only is this, um, you know, understanding organizational priorities important in terms of aligning your work with it, it's also in terms of keeping your work there because you know if you can't if you can't connect what you do to what the organization cares about um, what it what it values then you know as I said you're you're seen as maybe a nice to have but certainly not a must have and then appropriately enough the last of our deadly sins is last momentism um, the symptom of last momentism is when you report a bug or defect and well, the first thing you hear is, oh, my God, why are we finding out about that for the first time right now? You've killed our schedule. You've killed our release. Um, now, that can happen for various reasons. Uh, so one of the reasons could be, let's look to ourselves first, we're not running the tests in the right order. We're running tests that are important towards the end, and boom, we find, you know, important stuff on the last day of a of, of a test execution phase in, an, in a sequential project or a last day of an iteration in an agile project. We find some sort of true, honest-to-God showstopper, and, uh, you know, people are freaked out by that. And, you know, you're the bearer of bad news, so all of the usual things associated with that happen. Uh, so this one's easy enough to fix. Just put proper risk-based testing in and sequence your test based on risk. Now you say, Rex, I'm already trying to do risk-based testing, but what happens is that 
I don't get the work in time, the developers are giving me high risk stuff to test two days before the iterations end, or I can't get people to show up, or everybody's calling everything a you know risk level one and it doesn't help me sequence things. Okay, fix that problem. Um, and the way you'll motivate people to fix that problem is by explaining that this last moment discovery of critical defects is happening because we're doing risk-based testing, but we're not doing it right. Um, now, another thing that happens here too is that people will sometimes tell me, yeah, you know, we, we, run, uh, we run our pre-designed tests first and then we do our exploratory tests and other kinds of reactive experience-based tests, checklist tests, uh, error guessing, those sort of things. To which I said, well, we'll stop doing it that way because there's whole there's a whole group of bugs that can only be found with those sort of validation oriented kinds of tests. And some of those bugs are very, very serious. So, you know, make sure that your your reactive testing is integrated into the entire process. Um, this is usually not something that can be just hit with a magic wand and made to go away. Um, you know, you, you should expect that there is going to be some work um, to, to get this problem resolved. <clears throat> so I've certainly, you know, talked to, talked to clients, you know, that talk about testers finding major problems very late in test execution and people, you know, asking that question, why are we finding out about this for the first time right now? And they look at the problems like oh, they should have been found earlier not doing risk-based testing, not allocating the test effort properly. And, and um, you know, that leads to a lot of unhappiness. And I've seen situations where testing service providers did this and the, their clients decided, you know, we, we just, you know, we don't, we don't need their help. And, and, you know, in some cases, the testing service providers are like shocked, like, oh, well, you know, this, is, this isn't really fair. Think of all the, the embarrassment we saved them from by finding these bugs and so forth, you know, to which I would say, well, yeah, but you found them at the worst possible time. I mean, better than it's certainly you can say, well, would you rather I hadn't found it? But, you know, if, if you're saying that all the time, you know, you got to look to the, look to what you're doing and think, hmm, maybe I needed to be doing things differently because my client's not happy with me. And if your client's not happy with you, they're not going to be a client for much longer. It's, there's one thing I've learned from running my own consulting business for 24 years. It's, it's certainly that. Okay. Now notice that all of these things that I've been talking about, are, these are pretty simple, right? These are pretty simple behaviors. Um, you, know, you don't need a, need a degree in psychology to understand these things. So, you know, a degree in psychology could be helpful to understand why sometimes people do these things in the face of obvious negative outcomes to themselves. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. But, you know, you, you don't need a degree in psychology to understand what I'm talking about. If you've been in the testing business for any length of time, I'm sure you've seen a lot of these. Um, you certainly don't need a degree in mathematics or engineering either, because this is, this is, you know, it's human behavior and it's, and it's group psychology, right? Or group sociology, if you will. Um, so, you know, these are simple mistakes. The problems can be very serious. Having an entire test group let go or a testing service provider fired has happened in a couple of the case studies I described. I mean, this is, this is a serious thing that has, an, you know, serious impact on people involved. Um. So the first thing to do is, you know, see, am, am, am I doing this stuff? Is my team doing this stuff? And, and if so, how do, we, how do we resolve that? You know, and I've, I've provided you some ideas as we went along how to resolve things. Now, you don't, don't assume um, that you resolve these problems and immediately all the consequences are, are going away. Um, to paraphrase an old American saying that, you know, the, the entire congregation is happy when the, the town drunk stops drinking and gets, gets right with God, but that doesn't mean they make him the pastor tomorrow. Um, now, you know, that's, that's, it's a metaphor. I'm not saying that, you know, your situation is anywhere near that dire, but hopefully you get the point that I'm making that if you've, if you've caused some reputational damage to yourself or your team, it's going to take a while to dig yourself out of that. And, you know, you're going to need to do a little bit of, of uh, savvy marketing 
of how you've solved the problem and how you know you you have put your yourself and your team back on the, the straight and narrow and you know demonstrated um, demonstrated successes. I would encourage you to clean up the problem rather than just throw up your hands and say, well, these people, you know, they're always going to be unhappy with me now. There's nothing I can do to to fix this, so I'm just going to quit and go get another job because you're, you know, the, the, again, another hokey American saying is, uh, you know, where no matter where you go, there you are, right? So until you change the fact that these behaviors and concerns of testing are part of how you do testing, that's you're, that, you know, changing the, the people around you and the scenery around you isn't going to change that. Um, so, you know, I would say the, the going through the, the, the work of, of fixing the damage, if, if you've done some of these things, is, is worth doing. Okay, so as always, I will put the advertisement up while we take questions. I see that we have had some questions flowing in here. Um, let's see, we'll start with uh, uh, Venkata. Uh, I have a question. Please help with a helpful solution. Uh, I would assume that one can only help with a helpful solution because if I helped with an unhelpful solution, that wouldn't be helpful. But anyway, um, he asked or she, she asked, sorry, um, not sure of Venkata if that's a man's name or a woman's name, but um, how can we inculcate the real testing mindset in the organizations if higher up C testing is just one of the stages and do not clearly give due importance to testing. Great. Well, that that's that relates to something I was talking about earlier, which is this, you know, determining what you do that relates to what the organization values. So let me let me give you an example of this. I have a client where efficiency is everything. They're in the logistics business and they are very, very big about efficiency um, and saving money. So when I want to talk to people in that organization outside of the testing team about why testing matters, I talk about how testing saves them money because that's going to get their attention. I can talk about how much a defect costs them when it gets into their uh, logistics management systems and how much it costs when they find it and remove it earlier and you demonstrate potential return on investment and the amount of waste that gets their attention. Now, if I went to have a meeting, let's suppose that I got to have a meeting with Jeff Bezos, the head of Amazon, and I and I use that same argument with him. Oh, it's really important to save money and testing will save you money. And I would be at best politely escorted from the room at the end of the interview and not invited back. It, I might not, I might not even make it through the end of the discussion. Bezos might just look at me immediately and say, I don't care about that. Got anything else? Because Bezos is, is famously unconcerned with Amazon's profits. He's concerned with growth of market share. This is the thing that Bezos has been in pursuit of ever since Amazon's been around. And, you know, they're a constant expanding um, thing, you know, it's like the the sort of the, the story you hear, which I think may be a, a urban myth that, you know, the shark that stops swimming will immediately die. So Amazon is sort of like this this entity that you know Bezos seems to assume that if it stops growing, it will immediately die, and so all of his attention is about growing Amazon. So if I wanted to talk to Jeff Bezos about um, growing Amazon through testing, I would talk to him about how higher quality leads to customer loyalty, not alienating customers by having crappy websites that don't work properly. Now, ultimately, I may end up doing the same things for both of those clients if I were to be hired by Amazon to come in and do consulting. I might I might direct them to do from a day-to-day -day activity exactly the same thing, but the way I connect what the testing team is doing to the organizational's priorities is a huge difference. So hopefully that makes sense to you. Um, hmm. This is interesting. Oh, look like go to webinar. I changed their interface for a minute. And, but no, I'm better. Uh, let's see. Got a question from Rose, who asks, "What if the development and product and production teams, I guess, prod team, operations team, 
uh, don't know what they are doing. <laughs> there aren't any process to produce requirements. Hmm. <laughs> well, um, you know, information either gets pushed to you, Rose, or you have to pull it out. Again, pardon me for taking a sip of water there. I've, I've been saying for years and, in fact, wrote in my first book, Managing the Testing Process, that, you know, as a tester, you play the hand you're dealt. Um, my experience, both personal experience and working with clients where people try to do this, is that testing organizations that try to fix what's broken upstream in their development organization that's impacting them have a real challenge doing that. It's really, really hard. And one of the mistakes that, that is made here is that when they attempt to make such changes, they often express the need for such changes in terms of how the current behavior is negatively affecting testing, how it affects them. And then, you know, so you're t basically you're talking about your pain. Now, one of the things I always tell clients in this uh, about this sort of thing when you're trying to motivate change is to remember nobody cares about your pain. They care about their own pain. That may sound really harsh, and I mean, you know, it's not, it's not quite as bad as what I'm putting it. But what I'm, well, I guess my point being is that you're not going to motivate organizational change by talking about how something makes you unhappy. If you want to motivate somebody to change, you need to talk about how what they're doing is actually having a negative consequence for them, or for the larger organization, or better yet, for both. Um, and then maybe you can organize some, you can motivate some change there. Um, but, you know, um, you may or may not, Rose, be able to fix that problem. Uh, if you can't fix that problem, and especially this is true in an agile kind of world, you just have to be ready to go and pull that information out of people. Um, in, you know, collaborate, communicate, use tests as a way of expressing how the software is supposed to behave. You know, there's there's some good techniques out there like acceptance test driven development, called, also called specification by example, behavior driven development. These are established things. There's a lot of uh, popularity in those right now. So, you know, you could you could have a conversation with developers and say, hey, let's start using behavior driven development, and I'm going to teach you guys how how to, how to understand what's called a gherkin, this given when then type of a syntax, and we'll talk about how we expect the software to behave and automate some tests. And you could say, Rose, well, those darn developers and product owners ought to be doing that for me anyway. Well, yeah, but they're not, you know? So, you know, as, as a self-help kind of organization used to say, so what, now what, right? What are you going to do, right? If they're not going to change, either you figure out a way of working effectively in that context or you leave, or you stay there and you constantly are unhappy and you end up being an embittered and disgruntled employee. And then you leave, you know. A uh, comment from Keith here, who has left. He says, thank you, Rex. I have to exit the webinar early, but I want to say great job as always. I have seen every one of these <laughs> committed by QA and have been guilty of a few of them myself. Yep, um, we, we, all, we all have, Keith. Um, you know, that's why I led off with the first one, admitting that I, I had done that. This is, this, this is one of those smart people doing stupid stuff things, um, you know, and, and, and we do, you know, but that what makes you smart is when you recognize that is stupid stuff that I'm doing and I need to stop doing it. Uh, let's see, Venkata says, thank you, Rex. So I guess I did give helpful advice there, so that's good. Uh, let's see, you got uh, Jay McCurdy who says, Testers are often forced to operate within a culture of just getting things expedited. Some of the sins you describe come out of a simple ideal to do the right thing. In my experience, research to actually get factual data to support the tester perspective and market it back to the company has had to be a side of the desk or skunk works affair. This goes to deeper cultural problems and quality delivery eventually causing political challenges for testers. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I would agree that the, <clears throat> the tester perspective is different. And this is one of the things that makes us valuable as testers is that we do have a different perspective. Uh, you know, that professional pessimism, that critical eye, 
attention to detail, um, wanting to set the, the quality bar higher. They, these are all things that make testers valuable, that different perspective and, and, and is value that can be offered to the organization. And, you know, organizations do often value that when it's when it's presented in a way that connects to what their you know larger organizational success criteria are. Um, but we have to, we we as test professionals have to accept the fact that our perspective is unique, and uh, you know there are some there there are some frustrations that we are going to have in testing that are resolvable, as Jay is saying. You know there are things that you could do, but then there's other stuff that's just you know it, as the saying goes, the cliche goes, it comes with the territory. Um, let's see. Stefano says, thanks, Rex. I've seen many of these and the most nasty are the everyone can test and no need to educate testers as there are no skills needed to be a tester. I would agree that that is pretty, uh, that's way up there on the list of, of bad, bad ideas. Uh, and you know, we, we collectively as professional testers can, can set the bar higher by you know, continuing to try to advance what the profession is and what the skills are and what's necessary to become a tester. And the ISDQB program really is making a difference in that. You know, you're seeing a lot of situations where organizations get people certified at certain levels that they want to hire certified testers. So it's, you know, the problem is getting fixed. It just, it always takes longer than one might want. Uh, let's see. Gunjan says, basically want to understand how testers need to get ready for new technologies. And thanks a lot. Very helpful session. Well, you know, I mean, you you, you need to try to anticipate things that are up and coming, um, technological waves, and, and then, you know, get get your skills growth plan in place early. Um, you mentioned machine learning and AI. Yeah. So, I mean, this is something to start looking at, start learning about that, right? Don't don't be a late adopter of knowledge related to coming things because then you're, you know, you won't be um, one of the first people hired that has this expertise and can command a premium. You'll be one of the last when the skill sets become commoditized and you get paid whatever's left on the table. Um Let's see, another question from Rose here. How do we stop saying these are my bugs when leadership assigns them to you uh, so you can tell these are your bugs to test? Well, when I say my bugs, what I'm talking about here is, you know, like in, in the situation you're describing, you could say the bugs I've been assigned to test, the bugs I've been assigned to confirmation te test and those sort of things. You know, if, if by short you use my bugs as shorthand for that, I guess that's not the main problem. The problem is where it's my bugs in a possessive way, like my wife, my husband, my dog, my kids, my whatever, my car. These are this something I care about, and I will take it personally if you deal with it in a way which I find unacceptable, right? If you defer it, if you, if you downgrade its severity, if you... Uh, say maybe it's not that important to fix, you know, that becomes a personal affront. This is where that becomes a problem. Like, don't get personally involved, don't get ego involved with whether your bugs get fixed or the order in which they get fixed. It's just, hey, it, you provided information and the organization gets to choose how to handle it. Um, and Hamid asked a question, uh, any recommendations on autonomous testing? Is this the same as risk-based testing? I have never heard of that, so I do not know. So I cannot give any recommendations, I'm afraid. Um, let's see. Uh, Andra says, I would like to hear more about this. You play the hand you're dealt. How to get information about new features? I feel like I'm being kept out of the loop. Pull it out of the development team. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. If you're working in Agile, let's say, I don't know if you are, but if you're working in an organization that's doing Agile development, you are, as a tester, supposed to be a co-equal member of the team, and you're supposed to have the right, when you don't know something that you need to know, to go to the person you think knows it and ask them, hey, I need this information. Can you tell me how this works? 
there's supposed to be collaboration. There's, you should be able to, to do what sometimes referred to as pairing, which is, you know, you get stuck and you go and you find the right person and say, hey, help me get, help get me out of this ditch. You know, in Scrum, during the daily standups, there's that, that specifically you're supposed to be able to say, this is the thing that's getting in the way of me doing my job, of, of accomplishing my next task, and, and people are supposed to help you fix that. So, you know, if you're in an Agile organization, take advantage of the things that are part of Agile that are supposed to help you solve this problem. If you're not in an Agile organization, well, just act as if you were anyway and go and pull information out of people. Now, don't do it like in a demanding way, like you have to tell me this, you know, hey, I need your help. Um, and, you know, I'm trying to figure out how to test this thing. And can you can you help me understand, you know, make it clear that, you want them to help you and, you know, it's not you're doing them a favor or you're asking them for something they should have given you, right? It's, you know, you want, you're asking for their help to do your job. Um, the test says testing and scrum development or sprints. Do we have testing, testing user stories or should they be part of business story? Um, you know, I'm going to table that one, uh, come back, um, and a subsequent um, agile focused uh, webinar and let's talk about that or or maybe take one of our agile training courses and because that's that's too big for me to answer in less a minute um, Stefano says I have also seen the case of testers living in a bubble because they're still stuck in the command and control management mindset so my boss will tell me if I need to take any action when actually the uh, uh, organization is moving to servant leadership. Um, yeah, yeah, old, old, old mental paradigm problem. Um, organizations tried to make a change and a person is, is not recognizing it or is opposing it, definitely. Uh, and the test says, no worries. Thanks, Rex. Lovely session. Cool. Glad you enjoyed it. Um, Ryan says, last momentism. I've had experience with this a couple times in the past. Usually it comes down to the fact that we run exploratory testing towards the end of the project. Working in an agile development world, we don't see a full product until the end of the project. So early exploratory testing wouldn't always uncover defects that we are in the, that are in the final release. How can we, <coughs> excuse me, how can we improve early exploratory testing in this case? Well, now that's, this is a fair point. I mean, sometimes you, you're dealing with what are sometimes called emergent properties of the system. In other words, stuff that's not associated with a single user story or a single feature, uh, but that is ha grows out of the way that user stories or features interact with each other. And until you see the collection of those features that are interacting with each other, you don't necessarily see those behaviors. And this is not purely an exploratory testing thing, though. Certainly validation tends to be more likely to pick this up than purely, you know, requirements driven verification would be. Um, the thing you need to ask yourself, I would suggest, is that, you know, did when when you find a defect, look at it and say, could this have been found earlier? And if so, how, you know, and, and that really that that should actually expand to a broader root cause analysis kind of thing that happens where you look at should we have found this found and removed this defect earlier at some point like through a requirements review or a user story refinement session or something like that and and if so how do we do that and that's you know that's when organizations become actual learning organizations but you you don't have to be in a learning organization and uh, to decide to be a learning person within that organization uh van says thank you rex this was very informative you're welcome thanks for coming um, Kenneth says, thanks for a great session. I took a few notes to go back and apply and grow. Good. And remember that this will be, this has been recorded, um, and, um, we'll be posting the recording. So if there's anybody who should have attended and didn't get a chance to attend for whatever reason, uh, point them to the recording, which as I said, will be posted shortly. Um, I've got a few more questions, but I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to have to cut it off. I've got a, a big project that I'm doing for, uh, well, something I won't be, I can't talk about right now, but we'll be able to talk about in about six weeks. Um, but let me just close this session to tell you a little bit more on the, about the resources available on the way out the door. We do run these once a month. 
Um, so, you know, sign up, come back. Uh, remember, we're mixing it up this year. We got the traditional webinars like this one. We got the one key idea, 20 to 30 minutes focused on a single thing, practical, teach you something to, to you can do right away. And then we've got the two points of view at two, which is where I have a discussion with somebody who may disagree with me on a few points. And that's like a 20 minute dis discussion and give you know, give a little debate, chance for some debate. So we're doing those three in rotation. Um, and so far, people have been positive about all three. So we're, we're going to keep doing those. Um, if you like a special webinar presentation, one key idea, traditional, what have you, uh, for your company, um, just send us an email, info at rbcs-us.com, and uh, we can talk about it. Um, you can also sign up for our free newsletter, rbcs-us.com, which will get you valuable discounts on consulting and training services, along with a regular newsletter that includes a featured article on software testing and quality and news about uh, what RBCS and its partners are doing lately. Um, you can see my Twitter coordinates, my Facebook coordinates, my LinkedIn coordinates. If you want to connect on LinkedIn, if you are an attendee, I will connect. Uh, no problem. Also, our YouTube channel, which is where the uh, recorded videos get posted. But you can also find those on our digital library, um, including uh, podcast form if, if uh, you want to just listen rather than have to watch. Like this kind of webinar and the two points of view at two are really good ones for just, you know, podcast listening because you don't necessarily have to be able to see um, – you know, figures to, to understand it. Uh, remember that we offer these free resources as a service to the software testing community because at RBCS we are a not just for profit company. Uh, however, we do need to keep the lights on. So if you need uh, training, consulting, or expert services related to testing and quality, please contact us, info at rbcs-us.com. We don't expect to win all your business, but we'd like a chance to try to bid on all your business. Um, this concludes the webinar. Thanks to everybody for joining us today.